طيب بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فأسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يجعل هذا المجلس مجلسا طيبا مباركا فيه وأرجو الله سبحانه وتعالى أن تحفنا الملائكة وأن تغشانا رحمة الله سبحانه وتعالى وأن تتنزل علينا سكينته وأن يذكرنا الله سبحانه وتعالى في من عنده فإن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول ما اجتمع قوم في بيت من بيوت الله يتلون كتاب الله ويتدارسونه بينهم إلا نزلت عليهم السكينة وغشيتهم الرحمة وحفتهم الملائكة وذكرهم الله في من عنده وكتاب الله ليس محدودا في كلام رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم والصحابة ليس محدودا بالقرآن هذه معلومة مهمة ذكرها ابن القيم رحمه الله تعالى في كتاب الرسالة التبوكية ذكر أن في لغة الصحابة وفي لغة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا ذكر كتاب الله منفردا يعني وحده قال كتاب الله مثل هذا الحديث الذي أسلفناه فإن المقصود بكتاب الله هو الوحي الذي جاء من عند الله سبحانه وتعالى وينضم في ذلك طبعا سنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذ يقول الله وما ينطق عن الهوى إن هو إلا وحي يوحى من يطع الرسول فقد أطاع الله فعندنا كلمات تأتي في القرآن وفي السنة كلمات عجيبة يقول العلماء فيها كلمات يعني كلمتان إذا اجتمعتا تفرقتا وإن تفرقتا اجتمعتا شو يعني هذا الحكي؟ يعني إذا ذكر الله أو النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم هاتين الكلمتين في سياق فكل كلمة لها معنى لكن إذا ذكرت إحدى الكلمتين في سياق مستقل على الاستقلال انضم إليها معنى الكلمة الأخرى وهذا كثير شائع في القرآن وفي السنة وقد عددها كثير من العلماء منها المسكين والفقير مثلا المسكين والفقير إذا اجتمع المسكين والفقير إنما الصدقات للفقراء والمساكين الفقير يكون أشد فقرا من من المسكين لكن إذا ذكر المسكين وحده انضم إليه الفقير وإذا ذكر الفقير وحده انضم إليه معنى المسكين كذلك الإسلام والإيمان إذا ذكر الله الإيمان منفردا انضم إليه معنى الإسلام وإذا ذكر الله الإيمان منفردا انضم إليه معنى الإسلام أو إذا ذكر الله الإسلام منفردا انضم إليه الإيمان لكن إذا جاء الإسلام والإيمان في سياق واحد كان لكل كلمة دلالتها مثل قول الله تعالى قل لم تسلموا ولكن قولوا لا أسلمنا ولكن قولوا لا لا تقولوا آمنا ولكن قولوا أسلمنا ولما يدخل الإيمان في قلوبكم فهنا ذكر الله سبحانه وتعالى الإسلام والإيمان مع بعض فإذا جاء الإسلام والإيمان مع بعض كان الإسلام هو الأعمال الظاهرة والإيمان هي الأعمال الباطنة التي تكون في القلوب كذلك في حديث جبريل المشهور ما الإسلام؟ قال الإسلام أن تؤمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله قال الإسلام أن تشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله وتقيم الصلاة وتؤتي الزكاة قال ما الإيمان؟ قال أن تؤمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله فهنا جاء في نفس السياق الكلمتان فكان لكل كلمة معنى 
كذلك البر والتقوى وتعاونوا على البر والتقوى ولا تعاونوا على الإثم والعدوان كان البر بمعنى الأمور التي يفعلها الإنسان من الخير والتقوى اجتناب المحرمات لكن إذا ذكرت التقوى وحدها انضم إليها فعل الخيرات وإذا ذكر البر وحده انضم إليه معنى تجنب المنكرات وهكذا وهلم جرة ف... ف يعني هذا أمر مهم للإنسان أن يعلمه إذا أقدم على فهم كتاب الله وفهم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم جزاك الله خيرا فقول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في الحديث الذي ذكرناه يتلون كتاب الله قلنا معنى كتاب الله معنى كتاب الله هنا أي القرآن والسنة فانضاف إلى الكتاب معنى السنة لأن السنة من الكتاب بالمعنى العام من كتاب الله سبحانه وتعالى وبالمعنى الخاص كتاب الله هو القرآن والسنة منفردة فإذا ذكر الكتاب والسنة كان لكل كلمة معنى لكن إذا ذكر الكتاب وحده انضاف إلى ذلك القرآن وإذا ذكرت السنة وحدها انضاف إلى سنته كتاب الله سبحانه وتعالى وهكذا وهلم جرا فعلى كل حال نرجو الله سبحانه وتعالى أن تتغشانا رحمات الله سبحانه وتعالى وأن يذكرنا الله في من عنده فهذا مجلس نذكر فيه الله سبحانه وتعالى فنرجو أن يذكرنا في ملأ خير من هذا الملأ اللهم آمين uh, There is a narration that we began with which is collected by Imam Muslim in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said and no people will gather in a house of the houses of Allah in the masjid uh, reciting the book of Allah and studying its meanings amongst each other except that the, the uh, tranquility of Allah will descend upon them and the mercy of Allah will envelop them and the angels will surround them and Allah will mention them with those who are closest to He. The word Kitabullah, the Book of Allah, is one of those words in the Quran and Sunnah that if they are mentioned together, they have two separate meanings, and if they're mentioned separately, they have they have the same meaning. Okay? So Al Imam Ibn al Qayyim Rahimahullah mentions in his, his book Al Risal al Tabukiya. He mentions that in the language of the companions and in the language of the, the Prophet وسلم, when the book of Allah is mentioned, it includes the sunnah of the Prophet When the book of Allah is mentioned, it includes the sunnah. So when he discusses the book of Allah, he's speaking about the revelation of Allah because the sunnah is part of the book, not part of the Quran but part of the broader meaning of the book of Allah, meaning the book of law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah mentions in the Quran that he gave Musa the book, he gave Dawood the book, he gave the prophets the book, right? Every messenger he gave the book. What is meant by the book? Meaning the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that revelation has three branches of knowledge. The Quran, the Sunnah, all the revelations of Allah to the, to the prophets and messengers consist of three branches of knowledge. What are those branches of knowledge? Number one, the description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first branch is the knowledge of Allah. The second branch is the knowledge of Allah's will, meaning His laws, right? The third branch is the uh, the ruling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first branch is, is anything having to do with Allah's names or attributes or descriptions or actions or that's one branch of knowledge. 
The next branch of knowledge are the laws of Allah. Do this, do not do this, etc. The third branch of knowledge is the judgment of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is good, this is bad, this is, uh, this is good, this is evil. This is right, this is wrong. This is filthy, this is clean, right? This is the judgment of Allah. If you do this, you are prone to these consequences. Allah will judge the one who does this by punishing him this way. Allah will judge the one who does this by rewarding him this way, etc., etc. These are the three branches of knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down to humanity. Alhamdulillah, everything relevant to us to the end of time from all of the revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to all of mankind have been included in the Quran and Sunnah. Everything. Everything relevant to us. There may be little details that are not relevant to us that are not mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah. But everything relevant to us, the gist of what Allah sent to mankind as guidance in the form of revelation is all found in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet So the point here that we're making is that the book of Allah is more broad in meaning when it's mentioned alone than merely the Quran. When, when the companions or the Prophet وسلم, says the book of Allah, he's referring to the Quran and the, and the Sunnah of the Prophet However, if he mentions them together, he says the Quran and the Sunnah, now we have separate, they're separate, right? So this is an important thing to know and a very good fact about uh, learning the uh, Quran and the Sunnah. Another example is uh, Al-Faqir and Al-Miskin, for instance. Iman and Islam. These are also words that carry these same meanings. If Islam is mentioned alone, it includes Iman. If Iman is mentioned alone, it includes Islam. Right? If they're mentioned alone. If they're mentioned together, Islam refers to outward actions and Iman refers to actions of belief and actions of the heart. Right? Another example of this is Bir and Taqwa, righteousness and God-fearing. Right. When they're mentioned together, al-bir is doing good deeds and al-taqwa is refraining from evil deeds. But when taqwa is mentioned alone, it includes doing good deeds. And when al-bir is mentioned alone, it is including refraining from evil deeds. This is an important uh, list. There's a long list, actually, that some of the scholars have tried to point out throughout their tafasir, throughout their works of this type of word, where it's two words or three words, sometimes four words, right? So for example, the word ad the religion, it carries the meaning of al-ihsan and iman and islam, right? It carries all four of those meanings. And all of those words carry those meanings as well when they're mentioned alone. But when they're all mentioned together, they have different meanings which will be what we'll discuss tonight after Isha, inshallah. Ala kulli hal, we are continuing in the uh, 10 points that Ibn al-Qayyim mentions with regards to the issues and the things that a person can do or that Allah does to open the person's heart. We mentioned the heart has a, has a surface to it. And in order for that surface to be penetrated and in order for a seed of iman and faith to be planted firmly in it, it has to be dug up. Just like when you plant a seed in the ground, right? You have to disturb the earth. You can't leave it like it is. You have to dig it up. And that's a violent action, right? It's unpleasant. And the same thing with learning. When you are learning and you have an open mind, your what you think you know is constantly being tested and constantly being reformed. Because as some of our scholars have told us, الْعِلْمُ لَا يَقْبَلُ الْجُمُودِ Knowledge does not accept that a person be, that a person be rigid. It does not accept rigidity. 
Meaning that a person, no, I believe what I believe and that's it. Nothing else can change it. That can't be the way that your mind works. There are certain things that, yes, I believe in Allah and his messenger and the books and the angels and so on and so forth. But there are also details that for 40 years, 50 years, you may be a Muslim and always knew it to be this way. And then you come to the class and your mind is blown because you find out that this was actually incorrect or that it was actually something that you had misunderstood. That's the process of knowledge. And the students of knowledge, scholars, uh, shiuch, people that spend their life in knowledge, they are constantly digging and planting, digging and planting. And that process is continuous. So if you are not willing to dig, if you are not willing to allow your mind to be open and your heart to be opened, then you will never, you will never learn. This is the process of learning. Learning comes with, comes with that action of friction, of discomfort, of violence that happens where you have to open your heart and open your mind a little bit. Now we're not talking about opening your mind to everyone and anyone. We're talking about opening your mind and opening your heart by saying, this is something I may not know. This is something that I may be ignorant of. This is something I may have misunderstood. This is something, I know this narration for all these years, but now I've understood it a different way. I've actually misunderstood it for many years, right? Et cetera, et cetera. There, there are examples of this. Um, so this is why we come to class. This is why we come to lectures. This is why we go to people who study and spend their time and their lives studying we come to learn from them because this is what they specialize in. And we come to take from their knowledge. They work hard behind the scenes. So for example, for me to give a class like this, this is the culmination of, of, of 15 years of studying. So, so I am boiling it down and giving it to you and dispensing it to you. Not everybody has that time or has that dedication or has that knack to go and be a scholar. That's why we have scholars, and that's why we have to respect them. We have to uh, revere them, and we have to protect them, and we have to defend them, right? Because they are the, our sources of knowledge. They are our connection between us and the Prophet wasallam, and our connection between us and Allah. Knowledge-wise, not in, in, in worship, not in worship. Scholars don't have any special powers to forgive you. They don't even know if they're going to be forgiven, right? We do not holify scholars. Rather, we revere them and we respect them because of the effort that they have given and because of the specialties that they have and the gifts that they have. So of these things, Ibn al-Qayyim mentions, and we're here on the last two, Ibn al-Qayyim says, وَمِنْهَا أي مما يشرح الصدور بل من أعظمها إخراج دغل القلب من الصفات المذمومة التي توجب ضيقه وعذابه وتحول وتحول بينه وبين حصول البرء من الإنسان إذا أتى الأسباب التي تشرح صدره ولم يخرج تلك الأوصاف المذمومة من قلبه لم يحظى من انشراح صدره بطائل وغايته أن يكون له مادتان تعتوران على قلبه وهو اللمادة الغالب عليه منها وهو للمادة الغالب عليه منها العفو منكم Here we have a very important statement of Ibn al-Qayyim, and that is one of the greatest, most important things. He says, one of the greatest, uh, one of the things that open a person's heart, and then he says, actually, it is one of the most important and paramount things that opens a person's heart to the Qur'an and Sunnah, إخراج دغل القلب من الصفات المذمومة is that a person not only open his heart, but that he clean his heart out of the things which are rejected and uh, frowned upon and uh, uh, denounced 
by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What, what does this mean? Well, our ears and our eyes, they are direct paths to our heart, right? And whatever we subject our, our, our focus with our eyes with to, this goes directly into your heart. You've opened your heart and it's going directly in there. Whether it is you agree with it or disagree with it, it's still going into your heart, okay? The same thing with listening. There's a difference between hearing something and listening. When you listen to something, meaning that you are giving it your attention, you have now opened a direct path through your hearing to your heart. Now, society around us, the time and place and, 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 the, and the time in history that we live, what is the majority of things that go into our heart from the outside world, if we're honest? They're not good things, right? They're bad things. You, you know, the majority of society is on a verge of pushing towards evil, pushing towards decadence. If a person can't see this, then they can't see, right? Things that are, things that are considered to be very grave in the book of Allah are considered to be not a big deal in the, in the society and in the time that we live in. I'm not just pointing out and saying only in America. Yes, America is a beacon of this in a way. However, the rest of the world is followed in suit, right? And Islam started strange and it will re 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 return to being strange as it began, the Prophet wasallam said. So, all day when you are listening to things and when you are looking at things, even if they are simple things, right? Let's take an example. Everything that you see is a lesson. Everything that you see. It's a consequence. It's a lesson. What does that mean? Let's say you look at a, a little silly video, right? Some little TikTok video or YouTube or whatever is going on today, and, and you see some little funny video, right? Some kind of prank or some kind of you are subjecting yourself to something that is either in accordance with the Qur'an and Sunnah or against the Qur'an and Sunnah. Whether you agree with it or not, you are, uh, you are willingly subjecting yourself to it. So you're not rejecting it. And these things are getting worse and worse, right? And that's what the Prophet ﷺ said would happen near the end of time. He said in the narration of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, which is in Sahih Muslim, in the book of Imara, he said, alayhi salatu was salam, qala, inna wa inna ummatakum hadihi ummatun qad ju'ila afiyatuha, yani min al-fitan, al-mudilla anillah, qad ju'ila afiyatuha fi awaliha, wa sayusibu akhiraha بَلَاءٌ وَأُمُورٌ تُنْكِرُونَهَا وَتَأْتِي فِتًا تَحْقِرُ بَعْضُهَا بَعْضًا ماذا يعني تحقر بعض بعضها بعضا يعني تأتي الفتنة ثم تأتي فتنة بعدها فتصغر الفتنة التي جاءت قبلها تجعلها أصغر تجعلها أهون وهذا الذي نراه في التدرج في الشر التدرج في الشر يعني أن الإنسان يبتدئ بالشيء اليسير الحقير فلا يجد نفسه إلا وقد وقع في الشرور الكبيرة فينظر إلى الصغائر التي هي قد تكون كبائر في كتاب الله ينظر إليها فيقول هذه أعظم من هذه ويقيس الشرور على بعضها وهذا أمر خطير وهذا أمر سيعتري هذه الأمة كما وعد وأخبر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, the latter parts of this nation will experience fitan, 
tribulations. Fiten meaning tribulations, trials that will take a person off of the path of Allah. And each one of these fitan will dwarf the fitna that preceded it. What does that mean? It means that what came before will seem to be minimal compared to what is now. And what comes tomorrow of evil will make today's evil seem minimal. It will dwarf it, right? We could give examples of this. A good example of this is sexual perversion that has taken place in society today. Just even in this country, a non-Muslim country, a Christian country, non-Muslim country, 50, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, a woman would never be uh, seen pregnant from, from uh, unwed and have a, a bastard child. This was something that was outrageous. And many uh, documents and do documentation, many cases have been documented of women going to secret uh, abortion clinics in order to abort these, these children and these fetuses because of the shame that would incur upon them for uh, having premarital, premarital relationships outside of, outside of marriage. Now that's nothing. Why is that nothing? Because we had first women would dress a certain way, and then we had dating, and then we had bastard children. We tried to hide that, and then we added another layer of perversion, and then we had singers and movies and all these things that came along and glorified and romanticized to us these things until we have another wave, such as homosexuality, and then another wave that will come, such as such as other types of sexual perversion, which I'd rather not mention, right? And these things continue to come in waves and waves to where now we look at a man and a woman. A man has a girlfriend. They've been living together for 10 years. They have four kids. They have five kids. They're a lovely couple. We don't even look at it as being anything anymore. Why is that? Because that is the nature of the fitan, the waves of fitna that will come upon this ummah as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. And so, a lot of what we see, a lot of what we hear are bad things. They're, 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 they are not in align with the Qur'an and Sunnah, whether it be how people speak, how people walk, how people conduct themselves. Uh, pranks that they play on each other are totally inappropriate, right? Lies that they tell, certain things. It's supposed to be funny, right? But what you, when you're subjecting yourself to it, you are desensitizing your heart to this thing that is evil. It is evil. Even if all of society says, ah, it's not a big deal. What's the big problem, right? Uh, when I was growing up, subhanAllah, back, back in, 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 uh, in uh, Palestine, even here in America, in my, in my mother's time, Right? In the 50s, in the 60s, when Elvis Presley was a big thing, he could only get on TV and only this portion of his body here from the stomach up could be shown. Because what his legs were doing and his hips were considered to be inappropriate. We cannot show that on television. Right? Compare that to where we are today. Right? Now we say, Elvis, please come back compared to what we see today. Right? This is the nature of fitna. So we have become desensitized. You'll read things of the Quran, you'll read things of the Sunnah, and they seem like minutia, and they seem like little things, but in reality they are major things with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the knot is becoming untied and loosened in our hearts. So we have a lot of things that are in our hearts, all of us, that are in direct conflict with the Qur'an and Sunnah, in direct conflict with what good is by the yardstick and the measurement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, in order for good to come into our hearts, we have to get rid of the evil that is in it. How do we get rid of that evil? That's the question now. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says, الَّتِي تُوجَدُ 
التي توجب ضيقه وعذابه these things that are in the heart these things that have found their way into our heart and settled in our heart a direct consequence of these things of this evil of this filth that is in our hearts a direct consequence is that the heart will become tight and restricted and only partially open another consequence is that the heart will be in constant torment it will be torn between good and evil all of the time because you are exposing yourself to good and you're exposing yourself to evil and constantly the heart is being is being is is going through a type of punishment all of the time so we distract ourselves from this but when we sit down by ourselves in, and be quiet and don't listen to anything and don't watch anything that feeling of discomfort starts to manifest itself we're uncomfortable let me grab my phone let me look at something let me watch a funny video let me go watch a movie let me let me listen to something why because that is part of the punishment of the heart that goes on in the heart that literally causes torment and pain in the heart because good and evil are battling inside of inside of this heart which is not yet pure enough he says what the hulu bayna huwa bayna husul al bur and these things that are evil that we find in our hearts they may stand as a hindrance and a barrier between the sick heart becoming well it may stop the medicine so we will read the quran we will read the sunnah we'll act upon some of the things but if we expose ourselves to evil more so than we do to good what will happen what will happen is is that we will start to we will start to block the medicine which is the quran and sunnah because of the amount of illness that we have pumped into our hearts and dumped into our hearts uh it you know evil is like a it's like it's like a bacteria if you if you if you continue to expose yourself to the to to the bacteria and it grows and multiplies and and flourishes right and then you try to introduce antibiotics it, it might it might work it might not work right the it's nothing wrong with the antibiotics it's just that the that the body is not accepting it the bacteria is too powerful so you have to up the 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 antibiotics and we have to keep making them stronger and stronger because the evil is mutating and so these things will be a hindrance for the heart to become pure and the heart to become healed and this is important for us to heal our hearts heal our hearts from what heal our hearts from the evil that has has found its place in them whether we notice this evil or not whether we recognize it as evil or not and that's that's one of the worst case scenarios is that a person have evil in his heart and not even recognize that this is evil that a person be ill and not even know that he's ill or sick this is the biggest problem because identifying the illness is half of the cure as the scholars of Islam have mentioned قال فان الانسان اذا اتى الاسباب التي تشرح صدره ولم يخرج تلك الاوصاف المذمومه من قلبه لم يحظى من انشراح صدره بطائل he says رحمه الله that if a person does all of the things that we have just discussed of the things that open the heart but the person does not work to rid his heart of the filth and evil that is in it and does not clean his heart and cleanse it and purge it then he will not end up with a very open heart at all and all of his work to beautify and and better his heart may be in vain ibn al-qayyim says he says wa ghayatuhu yani man kana hadhi halu وغايته ان يكون له مادتان تعتوران تعتوران على قلبه and then a person will find himself in a situation where there are two things which are fighting for his heart he has the evil that he is allowed into his heart and then he has the good that he has put into his heart and so now they are fighting constantly 
And this is what psychologists call cognitive dissonance. He says, وَهُوَ لِلْمَادَّ الْغَالِبَ عَلَيْهِ مِنْهُمَا And eventually, one of them will win. By the time of his death, one of them will eventually win and overcome the other, either completely or partially. And he will belong to whichever of those two wins that battle. He will belong to whichever of those two wins that battle. So the heart has these, has these two things in them. How do we purge the heart? This is the question. Number one, the first most important thing to do is to stop whatever it is that is inject, injecting, excuse me, injecting evil into your heart. That's the first thing. Stop the flow of sewage that is going into your heart. And when you do that, the heart has become addicted to it. Just because you repent from doing something doesn't mean that you won't suffer withdrawal from it. You will, because the heart has become dependent and, 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 and has come to enjoy and fancy this evil thing. So you're going to go through a period of withdrawal, just like you do from a drug. Same thing. And if you'd like to test this, erase Facebook off of your phone. Try it. That time that you take, that half hour, every three, four hours where you scroll through Facebook, erase Facebook and spend those times reading the Quran and Sunnah. Not from a phone. Open a book and read from the book and see what happens. You'll start to go through withdrawal, literal withdrawal. You'll have depression, you'll have anxiety, you'll have this, you'll have that, because the illness is fighting back. You're going through withdrawal. That's what's happening. Right? Try to turn off this program and open the Qur'an. Try to turn off this song or this music and turn on the recitation of the Qur'an or a lecture of a scholar or something of the sort. What will happen? In the first few weeks, you will find yourself in this state of anxiety. But when that subsides, and the more you can continue to put in good into your heart, and you've stopped the influx of evil into your heart, what will happen over a month or two or three or five? You will start to look back at what you did and say, my God, what was I doing? And you will start to see the things that you looked at and enjoyed and laughed at all the time and took for granted as being things that are unholy and unworthy, things that are un inappropriate. Am I making sense here with, with what I'm saying? This is the process of, this is the process of uh, rejecting evil, right? It's like the same thing if, if a person goes on a diet, so let's say. The, 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 the spirit and the, the body are very similar in these ways. Let's say you go on a diet. You say, you know what, I'm going to cut out sugar completely. You're going to go through real physical withdrawal from sugar, right? And you're going to spend a month, maybe two, where you're actually craving sugar and you wish you could have it and this and that. But after that subsides, when you actually go back and have something sweet, you won't even enjoy it. So, ugh, this is... Some kind of sugar cone. It's too, it's too sweet, right? And the same thing happens with the heart. So how do we purge the heart? Number one, we stop the flow of sewage into the heart. We stop it. We don't do it anymore. Whatever it is. I, I don't know what it is. For different people, it's different things. But I will say, and many people will we'll disagree and come up with uh, all kinds of things that they rebuttal with when I say things like, uh, Facebook is not a good place to be. It's not. Instagram is a terrible place to be. Okay? TikTok is the worst place you could be on the Internet. One of the worst places. Right? But then a person will say, well, Sheikh, your lecture is being streamed on Facebook. Right? Your lecture is being streamed on Facebook. How are you denouncing Facebook? 
when it is actually something that you utilize. This is, this is something that we've kind of been forced to do because if we leave a platform completely open to evil, it will be completely overtaken by evil. And so the scholars of Islam have chosen to enter a platform in order to try to minimize the damage and the evil that flourishes therein. It's a different thing. If you have it, let's say you have Facebook and you just, uh, you know, you use it just to watch this lecture or this lecture or this lecture, that's fine, right? Use it very sparingly. But to turn it on and just scroll through it, scroll through it, oh, just 10 minutes, it just takes five minutes before you know five hours has gone by throughout your whole day. Five hours. In five hours you could have learned archaic Arabic. You could have memorized entire chapters of the Quran. You could have spent that time with your children, right? And so because of this social media issue that we have, TikTok and all of these things, it's just a 30-second video. Yeah, it's a 30-second video of nothing but pure garbage or if it's not harmful, the best case scenario, it's not beneficial, right? So it's just 30-second video. But when you add it up and you watch 300 videos, how many seconds do we have now? How many hours have gone by now? Uh, we've all been there, right? We've all been there where you're surfing on YouTube and you find yourself three hours later in some strange, obscure part of YouTube in some rabbit hole watching something you have no business watching. And the Prophet ﷺ would make dua and part of his dua, Allahumma ni'a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa' وَمِنْ قَلْبٍ لَا يَخْشَعْ وَمِنْ عَيْنٍ لَا تَدْمَعْ وَمِنْ بَطْنٍ لَا يَشْبَعْ Right? He used to make dua, Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from knowledge that is not beneficial. There is knowledge that is not beneficial. I seek refuge in you from knowledge that is not beneficial. And an eye that does not tear up with your remembrance. And a heart that is not focused and concentrated on your remembrance and your worship and devout. And I seek refuge in you from a stomach that cannot be filled. Right? This is the kind of dua the Prophet ﷺ would make. So, in closing, it is time for then now, just to kind of review what we've spoken about today, and that is, you know, a lot of people will rebuttal and say, oh, you know, social media, we're able to do things and so on and so forth. That's fine. What I'm saying is, these things, yes, they are a double-edged sword, but one edge is sharper than the other. And the majority of it is not good. We can admit that. It's not good. And every time your finger goes to erase the Facebook app or the TikTok app, you get a little voice in your head that says, oh, but wait, Sheikh so-and-so is on this app. Oh, wait, I use it for this. Ignore that voice and erase it and selectively choose and vet exactly what you're going to allow your ears to hear and what you're going to allow your eyes to see. If you do that, your heart will become purged eventually. But it won't become purged only by doing that. You have to as well continue to enter and flood it with the uh, light of Allah, the Quran and the Sunnah and uh, the good things that are good and be around good people and listen to good things. Allah A'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.